Break the Stigma. This is your host, Natalie Bolin. I'm with the Alcohol, Drug Addiction, Mental Health Services Board of Tuscarawas and Carroll County, the Adams Board. Hello, everyone. This is Natalie Bolin, and I am the Executive Director of the Adams Board. And the Adams Board is the Alcohol, Drug Addiction, Mental Health Board of Tuscarawas and Carroll County. Adams is a division of county government, and we are charged with developing services and supports to prevent, treat, and support recovery from any mental health or substance use concerns. Um, This is our first podcast that we're starting today, and the title of our podcast is Breaking the Stigma. And the reason that we are going with this podcast kind of umbrella idea for our podcast is because we know that one of the primary reasons that people don't discuss any mental health or substance abuse concerns is stigma. And um, the stigma is strong enough that individuals don't tend to seek treatment until they're at the point where um, it's become become a Mach 10 situation and the wheels are coming off. Um, And the hope is that that we're going to destigmatize this and normalize mental health and substance use a little bit more so that whenever the issues begin, people will get treatment sooner or support their family in getting treatment sooner so it doesn't keep getting that momentum. And I am lucky enough for our very first podcast to be sitting here with Percy Garner. Um, and I know that there's really probably no one in Tuscross County or the surrounding counties to whom he is a stranger. Um, I know that my, my kids and I sat and watched Percy when he was pitching for the Indians. And it was, even though we catch almost every game, it was a completely different experience watching someone who grew up in our community, in our, in our town. So, um, and the fact that he's willing to sit down to do this makes him pretty much a hero in our books. Um, so Percy, I think it's really funny how y- you agreed to sit down to do this with us. Are you willing to share kind of how you got roped into this? No, nah, I plan on just having one word answers. Okay, no, that's going to be great. That will make this go very well. Um, Josh? No, <laughs> no, nah, nah, I plan to share. Um, uh, I know when we spoke in March on the, the was that the Anti-Drug, Anti-Drug Coalition, Drug Coalition yep. podcast? I know I kind of caught you off guard, but that's just my personality. I love to share and uh, I want to make sure everyone knows what I'm about, that I'm a human and that I don't deserve to be on any type of pedestal. Um, And I struggle with the same problems that everybody else does. You know, it's funny you say you caught me off guard, but it was the best caught off guard for an Adams director ever. I mean, we were talking about, we were just sitting kind of around, we wrapped up our podcast and we were talking about mental health and substance use. And you just kind of jumped in and shared a little bit of your story. And I think my jaw dropped because rarely does anyone share their story that openly. And you were just here observing kind of the podcast experience and you, the fact that you, the fact that you shared that and tossed that out there. And then, you know, we ended up taping you. Um, Shows your age there taping. No, I'm joking. (laughs) It does show my age. Do you know that's the second time today I've used that? I'm taping a podcast this afternoon, so I won't be available. It's all good. That's like one of the running jokes of my podcast. I always talk about how people are older even though I'm, even if I'm older than them on the podcast, but so yeah, Percy, this might be your last <laughs> podcast. If you keep going down that track, I'm just saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. okay. So I, <laughs> I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about just kind of the Percy that maybe not everybody knows. Everybody knows you maybe in your, in, in your later years, but talk to me a little bit about growing up in Dover and what was that like? What was life like for you growing up here? Uh, life was, uh, very, I would say positive Mm -hmm. and, uh, I had a lot of fun and there were some hard times as well. Uh, but I would say as a whole, if I were just trying to summarize my life, I would say full of learning hardships and triumphs, I guess. Triumph. I'd never really use that word. It sounds good saying it though. Which, which Dover (laughs) elementary did you go to? I went to South elementary, you know, the best one. (gasps) That was from Percy, not from me. <laughs> Did you have a favorite teacher at South? Oh, why would you okay, ask don't, me this don't question? Don't do it. Don't no. answer it. I liked Mrs. Edwards, Mrs. Locker, Mr. <laughs> Andrews, Mrs. Matthews, is that and the Mrs. Whole, Tishman. Is that the whole staff? <laughs> yeah, but not to leave out Mrs. Bernie because she's, you know, she's 
top stuff now. <laughs> she was just my kindergarten teacher now. Aww. Now she's like, what, is she superintendent? No. no. Yes. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, she is the superintendent. So I, she was my favorite teacher she's of all time. <laughs> well played. Do your, do your kids go to Dover? They do, yes. My my son actually goes to South because of how the it's set up now. But yeah, my, my son is in, going to be in first grade. And Aww. so that's going to be fun. Did they start? Have they started? No, I think. A week from now or two weeks? I should know. Uh, that's all right. That'll be our secret. <laughs> I'm guessing your wife knows. Yes, yeah, she does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get that. Um, so when did you start playing sports? I would say I started playing basketball first because, uh, I mean, the football rules, we started when we were fourth grade. And then baseball, I played coach pitch. I didn't play t-ball. So mm-hmm. I was a, a late starter and all the other sports except basketball and Basketball was my favorite sport, still is, which is weird. Yeah. I just am not that good compared to the other sports. <laughs> but my dad and mom were like top notch basketball players. Were they? And I hear about it all the time and it annoys me a little bit. But because my mom, she came to my game before and she's like, why aren't you shooting the ball? <laughs> I'm like, because I'm not the shooter on the team, mom. You know, I'm not the it's best player like my you. my job. <laughs> Um, so tell me when you started playing baseball, how old were you? I was eight, uh, coach pitch. I started playing, Mm -hmm. can't remember the team, but I do remember getting thrown out of game. Um, no custom wood design was minor league, Josh. (laughs) Yeah. Sit it down. (laughs) Coach pitch. Uh, I think you're eight and nine in coach pitch. And I can't remember the team I played on, but I know I, I got thrown out one of a game just because I was super competitive and I would cry when I lost. Um, we're going to need to hear more about that whole story. I'm I'm sorry. You got thrown out of a coach pitch game. Yes. Okay. So I threw a fit when, so in baseball, there's things called force outs where you don't have to tag the play or anything. And uh, I was playing third and the ball was hitting the play and my teammates threw me the ball at third and I stepped on the base and threw the ball back to the coach. He's out, right? No, <laughs> there was no one on first. So it wasn't a force out at third, but I didn't know that at eight. And um, I threw a a temper tantrum and uh, embarrassed every part of my family that was there. (laughs) And uh, I can't remember. I don't think it was my first game. Hopefully it wasn't my first game. But um, but yeah, the umpire had no choice but to just he said, you got You got to get out of here. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) He wasn't like yelling at me like you're out. But, you know, you got to go gather yourself. (laughs) My child. Yeah. Yeah. Just and my dad's like. (laughs) <laughs> you better get in the car. We're leaving. So, uh, but yeah. Is that why baseball wasn't your favorite? Yeah. Yeah. And, and baseball was just, uh, it was a different sport compared to the other ones, you know? So for somebody that has not played all those sports, well, philosophically, like what for you was the primary difference between those three sports? Uh, I feel like basketball and football, you just use athleticism mm-hmm. and you know, could overpower or any type of way, you know, kind of use your athleticism in the game to trump other skills, like maybe knowledge of the game. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Baseball, on the other hand, I mean, you can see players now that are just, you wouldn't think they're an athlete if you saw them on the street, but since they're in a, a uniform, you're like, okay, they're a baseball player. But um, a lot of that is just repetition and being able to repeat the same movement over and over again and knowing every possible move you're going to make before the pitch happens. And that comes with years of playing. Mm -hmm. Um, But basketball, football, you know what the goal is. If anybody just sitting there watching, Uh you can just come in on the court and say, okay, we got to make it in the goal or, Hey, we got to cross this line and it's a touchdown baseball. It's kind of, yeah, obviously there's the one-on-one battle between the pitcher and the hitter and you know, you have to get them out. But there's so many other things that I guarantee a person will go, well, well, well what happens if this happens or what happens if this happens? Who, who are they? Do- what are they trying to do? Yeah. <laughs> so and my wife is one of those. She was one during the World Series when there was a Grand Slam hit. She said, "Ooh, a four run home run. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> fundamentally, that's what it is. Yes. But we go, a oh. grand slam, and she goes, oh, that's what that is? God I go, love her. oh, no. That's my wife. Yeah. <laughs> a professional baseball player's wife, yep. But I think, <laughs> you know, having boys that have played baseball, not only do you have to be aware, like you said, it seems of every move that you make and the, the move before and the move after, but everyone else's move on the field where everyone else is at their base. I mean, why yeah. am I telling you? <laughs> Don't, that was, let's yeah. cut that out. We'll edit that part out. 
Right? I mean, no, you're telling everybody. But no, yeah, you have to, I mean, cutoffs. You got to know where your cutoff man's going to be. You, as a pitcher, you're not only throwing the ball, you got to back people up. Some teams, they want you to direct who's catching the ball. And what pitchers don't like to do is back up home plate whenever we get up a hit and we know someone's coming home mm-hmm. and we have to make sure the ball doesn't get back to this catcher. It's, uh, uh, it's things that you pick up. Uh, from not doing them in games and then have to do them uh, a lot at practice. <laughs> so <clears throat> the thing that made you maybe steer away from baseball a little bit was that intense mental needing to know everything about everyone, where everyone was going in addition. I mean, it wasn't just you. It was you and everyone else on the field that you had to be aware of. Yeah. That makes sense. No, how many outs, you know, all that uh-huh. stuff, especially when you get to the upper levels. The, the and we've had this thing with the Astros stealing signs, but when you try to, it's a game within a game with the signs, you know, uh-huh. you got to know some, I did a lot of the time I did outs plus one. So you have to know how many outs there are. And then if you want a curveball, say that's a two, then he would throw down a one and you're like, okay, outs plus one, there's one out. Okay. That's a curveball. <laughs> it's just a constantly like, uh, Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. So did you tell me, did you play all three sports in high school? Yes. You did. Yeah. You, basketball. I think I got two years of letters, but, um, but yeah, I was, I loved basketball and early on, I thought that was going to be my sport. Yeah. You know, too slow for football. Um, and I could shoot a little bit, but we had, uh, some good talent at Dover when I got to, uh, freshman and JV and varsity. So quickly I became, uh, the rebounder and the guy who set picks and stuff like that. <laughs> so one of the things that we talk about a lot, um, with kids is resiliency and, having that one person that's not related to you and that's not family who you believe has your back, who, you know, you can go to, who was that for you whenever you were younger? Um, hmm. So growing up in the community, I feel like I had a lot of people who had my best interests, mm-hmm. teachers, um, a couple that stood out were Mrs. Tally. She was the gym teacher. Um, I'm trying to think back now. I know, like a lot of teachers I mentioned as my favorite teacher from mm-hmm. South School, uh, Mr. Arbogast, um, he took a special interest in me and wanted me to make sure that I was, uh, like when the racial stuff came up, you know, back then I never had like really racial problems, but he wanted to make sure that, uh, cause we don't have a lot of like teachers or black, um, like leadership positions at Dover, like coaches or teachers. So he wanted to make sure like, you know, you can do anything you want to do. And just to have it, have information like coming from people that I really didn't know like that. Yeah. It, it did, it, it sit differently. So, you know, obviously my dad, mom, or, you know, family, they're going to tell me, Hey, you can do anything. You can do this. You just got to work hard. Um, but then having someone that doesn't look like me say, Hey, like you're a leader, like look at it this way. This is how you, this is what you're going to do when you grow up. Don't, you know, don't shy away or, you know, don't let fear set in and, uh, Um, but you know, talking about fear, I don't know if we want to get into that yet, but I would say my dad and he was more of like a military guy who was in the air force. My, his dad was very, you know, strict and, uh, just the relationship I had with my dad because he passed away when I was a freshman. So we didn't have that that I didn't have that epiphany where I'm like, Oh, my parents actually know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I never really had that moment with him. So I always looked at him as a, as a, a a mean, strict father who, you know, didn't really understand what I was going through. And I've always felt like I was walking on eggshells around him. And I think that kind of trickled into other aspects of life never socially i mean i've always because my dad is social butterfly as well you do seem really reserved (laughs) is that how you describe me josh (laughs) all the time he says um but i mean do it should i keep diving in okay okay um so just the simple things you know obviously he i was punished uh, with through groundings mm-hmm. and you know with the belt switch finger like flicking or whatever it was at mm-hmm. the time that he could get his hands on that he thought would help me understand that I can't do that anymore mm-hmm. or I have to do this uh, and it kind of made me you know just that 
I don't want to mess up. I don't want to do anything wrong. And that's just what I cling to. I don't know if that's what it is. That's just what I cling to once I started to think about and have these mental uh, health issues, I guess, as I got older and started to realize them. Because there is a point where you just, you think these are normal thoughts. You Mm -hmm. don't think something's wrong. I shouldn't think this way. You're just like, well, you know, this is what it is. So how did your dad, and and I have heard tremendous things about your whole family. I've heard tremendous things about your dad as well. Um, Tell me how you knew what your dad or and mom's expectations were. Um, well, my dad, he, I just knew cause he, they, he didn't like hide them from me. He let me know on a daily basis, this is what you need to do or else, you know? So, um, he knew what I was capable of. I mm-hmm. didn't at a certain time. He's like, I've always had good grades, but not, you know, 4.0 or all A's. And I remember there was a one time I want to say it was either sixth or seventh grade, I came home from school um, and then when he got home from work, he, he saw the report card and it was A's and B's. I was like, you know, I'm good. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you know, let me talk to you. Um, If you don't bring home straight A's next nine weeks back when, uh, is it still nine weeks or is it? (laughs) But he said, if you don't bring home straight A's next nine weeks, you're going to be grounded. And I was like, you know, and he knew when there was dances. I don't know if he did. It's just the timing was always perfect where there was dances or a party or something to go mm-hmm. to. And, uh, and I'm like, oh, my, there's there's this school dance that I can't be grounded. Uh, and next thing you know, I brought home a 4.0 and just stuff like that where I was like, huh, maybe he knows a little something. <laughs> but, but still, for the most part, I just felt like he was, you know, mean and I feel like I get that from my son right now and I know I'm not as bad as my dad Mm -hmm. was uh well per se um but I just know I looked at my dad as an authoritative figure and you know not many people outside of our household saw him like that you know they're like oh your dad's so great which he is right Um, you can be both yeah but I just didn't realize it I didn't see him as I just saw him as one way and that was uh for the most part I didn't want to, you know, do anything wrong to make him mad. Yeah. Yeah. But hearing stories about a lot of people's families and their fathers after the fact, I'm like, oh, I didn't really have it that bad. (laughs) And that's while that may be true, everyone has their stories and their experiences. And it's it's you know, I I get that we kind of want to compare across our families, but that's what you lived. And that's what that's what's significant for you. So how stressful was it for you to to bust out four point? Um, to be honest, it wasn't, it was just a little bit extra effort good, good. <laughs> that I he knew what he was doing. Yes. That I didn't know or feel like doing, I guess. Yep. Um, and I was the type of kid that would, I was in sixth grade and they were like, Hey, there's this class, there's test you got to take. You can get out of class for a period and lunch is next period. I'm like, Oh, I'll take that test mm-hmm. for sure. And then next thing you know, that landed me in AP cat classes when I got you know, older and I didn't know that's what was happening. And I Tricky. didn't know that I was getting advanced classes, you know? Yep. And next thing you know, I'm telling my friends like, oh, yeah, I'm doing um, algebra one and eighth grade. And they're like, I'm doing pre-algebra or something like that. Or no, I did pre-calculus or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And they're just like, oh, I'm doing algebra. I'm like, well, why, why aren't we doing, why aren't we in the same class? Because <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. Then they started putting me in honors language arts. I'm like, wait, hold on. I didn't take wait that test. Wait a minute. Let's, <laughs> let's slow, slow this down. down. I'm good at math and <laughs> science. That's about it. So I think... You know, and this isn't even necessarily about your family, because I think the stories that you're telling are are just really typical, normal stories. And it sounds like your dad really had high expectations for you. And he kind of saw something in you. He knew that you could achieve at the level that you did. Um, But you also mentioned walking on eggshells, which, again, I know is not a Percy only feeling. Um, But are you willing to talk about what what walking on eggshells meant for you? Um, well, there's so many levels to it. It could be, you know, when I was a child, just making sure, um, let's, for an example, one time I, and this was when he was sick, but I spilled, um, some, I think it was sun kissed in the refrigerator just to spill, you know, people mess up. I'm clumsy. And, uh, I got grounded for a month for, for spilling, you know, stuff and I cleaned it up washed the because I was doing my own laundry in fifth grade <laughs> I was proud of that should be yeah but um I washed the 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 
the little rug and everything. Everything was good, but you know, it, he just saw me like, no, you you can be better than because I don't know how he saw this, but I started to see it once I got older. I just looked at myself and I didn't n- n- necessarily have the confidence that I wanted or that I displayed socially. Like I'll go up and talk to anybody, but when it comes to sports or schoolwork, I just never had the confidence that, yeah, I can graduate in, you know, the top of my class or yeah, I'm pretty good at football and baseball. You know, I was always on the mound thinking, okay, I I can't throw a ball. And that's not necessarily, my dad was never that dad that was like, you better perform well on the field or else it was never like that. Um, he, that's that kind of the cool part of him. He was, he would videotape me and like kind of laugh and stuff. Yeah. And what are you like, Oh, come on purse. What are you doing? But it wasn't along the lines of, you know, basic stuff around the house that he was trying to instill in me like manners and stuff like that. Uh, and I didn't take that stuff seriously at the time. So mm-hmm. I was like, why isn't he mad when I do bad on the field? But if I don't wash this dish correctly, you know, he's on my tail. Like, <laughs> So looking back now, why do you think he did that? I think, especially with his military background, what I've learned is conquering the monotonous and the small things and the very intricate details. If you can take care of those on a daily basis and look at those as important things, pretty much everything else will take care of itself. If you're able to, you know, and I I guess they say that in the Bible too, like he who is responsible with little will be you know, where I'm going. <laughs> this is the second time I messed up. My pastor made fun of me last time. <laughs> I messed up the uh, the chairs at the church. I was getting a lot of messages for that. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's, you know, he's trusted with a little, you know, will be trusted with a lot or something like that. And I think if you can, you know, really take care of your small details. And I've heard that. The funny thing is that when I, when I played college football, my foot quarterback coach would always say details, purse details. I'm not going to say what else he would say, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it just, it, it's funny how it carried on through my life. But I think he was just trying to really hit home, like take care of the small details and it, you'll, it'll, it'll get you a long way. And while you're 13, 12, that's, you know, that's not necessarily something that you want to hear, but it sounds like it really stuck with you. Yes. Um, and I'm trying to instill that in my son now where it's like, Hey, put your dish in the dishwasher, rinse it off, uh, you know, throw this away, you know, Hey, do this for your sister. It's just little stuff. And, um, I just, you know, it would have been nice to respond to it a little bit different now that I look at it now. Um, but it it does mean a lot to me now. And I'm pretty sure, you know, he, he can see that now. Obviously Mm -hmm. I would love to show the appreciation Mm -hmm. in person, but uh, I'm pretty sure he's looking down and he's like, OK, he gets it finally, finally. <laughs> well, and absolutely. And not only does he know that you get it, but so much so that you're putting it out for the public to understand how when your dad or your mom or whoever it is, whoever is significant in your life does have high expectations. Yes, there's a part of it that we'll talk about how that may impact you, but really it's coming with good intentions and the intention to develop you into a, a strong person and an amazing person and a detail oriented person. And I love the fact that you said that thread had carried with you really from that point on. So it wasn't even just a dad message. It was a life message, which is really incredibly cool. I like how you can just take what I say, what I think is like a whole whole bunch of mumbo jumbo and just summarize it. I put a bow on it. I will put a (laughs) bow on that and we will serve it in the table. I like it. (laughs) So tell me when you started to really experience success at sports and you knew, and and the people around you were giving you feedback about this kid is really something special. He's really fundamentally talented. So it it varied for sport early on baseball Mm -hmm. right away, just because I threw hard you know, and kids were scared to face me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, um, baseball, I had good early success soon as, uh, I think cause coach pitch was eight to nine. Soon as I was 10 and went into minor league and I was pitching, you know, I was throwing no hitters in the newspaper and stuff like that. My grandma was taking out the clippings. So I knew I knew I was good at baseball, uh, and basketball had some early success as well. Um, you know, fifth, sixth grade, uh, in, into middle school, um, but football, really, I always looked at myself as just being on the field for decoration. 
<laughs> That's what I like I to say. <laughs> you know, because my dad was this fast receiver. He was more of a leaner guy. I took more of my mother's side of the family was size, so I was slow. Because um, my older brother was a running back, and he was here for coaches first year at Dover. And, you know, he was really great running back and super athletic. And um, and then we had just the history of athletes coming through. So I was like, oh, that's what I'm going to be. And then I wasn't fast <laughs> for one. And uh, I was like, well, I guess it's going to be baseball uh, until uh-huh. high school. <laughs> uh-huh. And then I knew um, of my junior year is when people started to take notice uh, after coach F made the switch of putting me at quarterback. And after about halfway through the season, my junior year, that's when I felt pretty confident in my abilities, but going into every game, I still needed a completion or to get hit just to kind of like, okay, I can, I can still do this. Say more about that. So early on, I knew I didn't really know what it was about, Mm -hmm. but I knew I shouldn't be this way. Um, I knew I didn't want to be cocky, Mm -hmm. but I knew I shouldn't be doubting myself game after game after game. Uh, So I would just, my mentality was, I I guess I was reaffirming every game that, okay, I I think I am good enough to to compete, to be quarterback of Dover. And I I guarantee most people wouldn't know this. Uh, Maybe my close friends, like, Micah, he never told me about it, but the way we talked about his confidence level on my podcast and he, I always kind of envied that uh, about him, him and Daniel, they just, you know, they were never like thinking about what their body was doing or what they had to do. They just had confidence that, you know, they would be able to rise to the occasion and do whatever they needed to do. And, And me on the other hand, you know, and it cost me a little bit in sports and and, and a lot of stuff. I just would overthink things. And, you know, a lot of the coach I had before and a lot of my other coaches with, you know, sometimes you just, you're too smart for your own good. Just stop thinking all the time. And I I think just me not believing in myself all the time really kind of hindered me early on, but I overlooked that because I was able to still perform because the the talent pool that I was playing against wasn't really, you know, at advanced as, as compared to when I got to college and mm-hmm. the pro level. And that's when it really sunk in and I started to have those thoughts and started to be aware of those thoughts of am I good enough and stuff like that because I was able to get away with it early on. But That's the second time <clears throat> in the last 15 seconds you've used the words good enough. Yeah. And, and what I was trying to talk to talk about before was I always kind of once I started to be aware of those thoughts, I always brought it back to, well, I think it was my dad because of how he did this or had me thinking. And I thought the walking on eggshells contributed to me not having confidence in myself. But then um, I was like, no, I don't I, no, I kind of don't know now. And I, I don't know why I'm having these thoughts. And once I didn't really address them until I want to say 2017 is the first time I really addressed them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, by that time, it's just like, no, that was toward the end of my road with the Indians. Um, well, and I, I, I think really parents try their best. They, they really do try to set, we, we try to set our children up to be the most successful, kind, compassionate, productive versions of themselves. And children receive that message differently and they make their tape in their head. And a lot of times it's not the tape that we intend as parents. You know, we all have our tape. We all have our tape from our childhood. Um, so, you know, even if, even if us, even us saying, you have maybe a good enough tape. I don't think you, I don't think either one of us think that your dad would have ever intended you to have the good enough tape. He always wanted to show you that you could succeed and, and you could do more. But the way that we internalize that sometimes through no intention of their own becomes the tape that kind of holds us back just because that's how we roll it. Um, so I'm hearing you say that whenever you were in Dover, you had the good enough tape. Um, but you send it, you seem to go out and conquer it pretty much most of the time. Yeah, I would say that. And I also would like to bring, there was a lot of underlying issues to 
that my dad, I don't even know if he knew about, um, where he was not involved in Mm -hmm. that, you know, there was, there was, my mom was abused, not by him, Mm -hmm. but, um, by someone else. Um, you know, I was abused, uh, in more ways than one. And I think a lot of that stuff set into, but just the fact, um, knowing how great my dad was and, you know, this, that, and that, mm-hmm. everything else. Like there wasn't really one thing where I was like, Oh, my dad's not really that good at that. Mm-hmm. Cause musically he was talented. He played in the band at church, uh, every sport, um, you know, everyone loved him. I mean, he even ran track, which I would never be able to do. <laughs> and the biggest thing, and this just popped in my head. The biggest thing I saw him do was change his life totally around my fourth or fifth grade year when he, cause my dad was into, you know, he, you know, smoked marijuana, he drank and all that stuff. And all of a sudden it just stopped. The music in the car that we listened to changed. Everything changed. The people we hung around changed. And that made an impact when he, we started going to church. Cause my grandma and my aunt Susie, we always went to church, but for them it was, all right, like I, I need candy to survive this. Uh-huh. I need some paper and a pad to play tic-tac-toe. Um, but when I went to church with him, uh, me and my little sister, it, it was it was just different because I looked up to him at a certain level where, wow, like this is not this is not my dad anymore. You know, he's totally different right now. And and he's living, you know, a good like even better life than I already thought he was. Mm-hmm. And then. And I think that was another pillar that made an impact, you know, and that's when the, you know, we're going to get religious here. Like when the devil creeps in, because, you know, you get close to when you're starting to get close to God, I feel like, you know, the devil doesn't want to let you go. And you start doubting yourself. Am I good enough to be a part of the kingdom? And and I think that was another pillar that kind of the God thing. I knew I was sinning and I knew, you know, my friends would be like, well, you're a good person. You'll be all right. You don't have to stop doing this. You're all getting to heaven. You're a good guy. And, you know, I started to realize that that necessarily (laughs) isn't the case because technically we're not that good. But (laughs) you really respect your dad, don't you? Uh, Just a tad. Yeah, (laughs) that's outstanding. Are you are you. Let me think about how I want to ask this. What was the most significant change? I know that you were talking about a lot of the behavior changes that your dad did around fourth and fifth grade, a lot of things that he did differently. What did you see that was the most significant difference in the way that he interacted with you or parented you or gave you messages? Parented me. Okay. I would say the language and I guess his, I want to say it, his language for sure. Um, There were a lot of, you know, bad words before. (laughs) Uh, And it always seemed a lot of when I was being punished, it was his anger. That's why he was mad. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was getting punished. Not because of what I did. I would say once, you know, he made the the life change, it was more of a, he was no longer like yelling and mad Mm -hmm. when I was being punished. It Mm -hmm. was more of like, you know, I have to do this because you, you did that. Mm-hmm. And uh, even if I don't agree with it, sometimes my grandma will forget something. So, and he would come home from work and she would be like, well, he did this. I'm like, oh, man. Uh, so even when I was a freshman, I would still I got a woman, I think the summer before my freshman year. And that was like the most civilized spanking I ever had. That's <laughs> such an interesting way to put it. Um, but, yeah, that was the the, the way he spoke. Um, and a lot of, I saw a lot of it, how he treated, uh, the woman he was with mm-hmm. for the most of my life. And, uh, cause when him and my mom split up, I think it's cause she loved the Browns and he loved the Steelers. That'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was in relationship with, um, uh, basically who has been my second mom. Mm-hmm. Cause my mom went away to prison and I'm, her name is Tommy, but I, everyone just calls her Mo. She basically instilled a lot of you know, mother, these stuff. Wow. Cause my mom loved on us and yeah. she was super soft. She never <laughs> laid a hand on us, especially when she got out of prison. She was like, I'm going to be the nicest mom ever. I missed out on three years. Oh. And at, my, at the time, my sisters didn't need that. They still needed, you know, some type of structure, mm-hmm. but, but yeah, like 
just a lot of a lot of stuff and a lot of impact uh, in different ways and yeah well and for boys you know your most important role model is is your father is the man in your life whether whoever it is whether it's your father stepdad whoever it is and for girls the most important role model is going to be you know the female in your life and so it's just it's it's interesting and i know i got really personal percy and i'm sorry (laughs) um but it's just it's really interesting to see how kind of personality and sense of self and the messages that we give ourselves evolve and how yours evolved from the most significant male in your life. Um, and, and, you know, very clearly how you feel about your dad and, and your depths of love for him yeah. is clear. I, I would say also my stepdad and his actions mm-hmm. kind of glorified my dad even more. <laughs> Cause yeah. you know, my dad would argue with uh, my mom and, uh, and Mo, but it never got to the level. So whenever he would argue, it would be, You know, they're just, you know, they're arguing. I stopped calling it fighting because then I saw what real fighting was. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think um, in the long term, and I started to kind of see what I was about. And I I took a lot of that from my dad and, you know, some of my bad habits um, I got from other people. (laughs) You and I know that we need to move, move forward, but you have talked a lot about, um, a lot of things that you went through and some of them I won't touch. And some of them we've dove into, I mean, that that's your story. Should you, should you ever choose to tell it? Um, and Percy, these things that you've either mentioned in detail or just d- mentioned would have and have broken a lot of people. And they wouldn't have had the opportunities and the um, success that you had. How did it not break you? So that is a good question. So I would owe it to a lot of, I would say a few things. So one, even before this happened, because I wouldn't say I had a relation, a real relationship with God until, Mm -hmm. you know, teenage years, I would say, my overwhelming family support, even despite, you know, my mom going to prison and my dad passing on my aunt, Susie and uncle Grover, or they were like, you know, cause you know, I think I've shared this before, but my mom, uh, she went to prison because of drug trafficking. And I grew up a lot around that scene. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who I found out later, you know, were addicted to drugs and I had no idea. And I kind of looked up to them as too, because they were athletes. Um, but once I got in that household, it kind of like, they were like the model family, even though they weren't perfect to right. me, I was like, man, this family is perfect. You know, uh, cause my aunt and uncle, they had two kids that went to Dover and you know, they were never really in trouble. They played sports, whatever. And then they went to college and they just went on. And to me, that was like. Well, that's, that's what a family is supposed to do. They're supposed to have a dining room table. They sit there and eat. And yeah, my aunt wouldn't let me leave the table until I ate everything, even the peas. Oh, the peas. <laughs> <laughs> but once I lived with them, it was like, wow, okay. Like, this is, this is great, you know. And I'm not, my dad and uh, Mo, that was sort of like that too. But, you know, they didn't really look like me. So I just... When I looked at white families, I just assumed that's how it always was. Yeah. But then when I looked at black families, every black family I knew wasn't, you know, set up that way. Yeah. And it's funny when I got to the big leagues or in the professional professional baseball and I had to, you know, when we we're taking our physicals, they asked for a family tree in their health. And I had to draw out this family tree and everyone was always like what is this? And I'm like, you know what? Don't worry about what's going on in my family tree. There's just so many like stuff going off and uh-huh. they're like, okay. Cause you know, most people just grew up in the mom, dad, couple sisters, whatever, maybe some cousins that they never talked to me. On the other hand, <laughs> I had great relationships with, you know, distant cousins. Mm-hmm. So, um, I just had a lot of people, a lot of people that lended support to me mm-hmm. and including people like coach shift and, you know, the teachers I mentioned, um, cause I, and I feel like the earlier teachers have a bigger impact high school. It's just a little different. You kind of, you don't look at them the same way because you're, you're a teenager. Right, they right. don't know what they're doing. Right. So <laughs> with every star. Thanks for 
joining us. Tune in for the next episode.